chapter number 4, verse 5, is where we'll begin the reading of God's Word. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 5 says this. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went to the man of God and told him what happened, and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what's left. I want to tag a title to this text. I'm going to see if this section will talk back to me when I give you my subject. I want to talk from this subject in our time together, strategies for stress. Strategies for stress. As we sermonically swim in the pool of this passage this morning, I want to announce to those who are seated in this space watching us online that there is an emotional epidemic that is impacting people, not only who are occupying space in our country, but is also impacting people that are occupying space in our churches. It is an emotional epidemic that is so disruptive and destructive that an article in the Wall Street Journal suggested it is responsible for taking more lives than smoking, drinking, and not exercising combined. It is such a weapon of mass destruction that the University of London said if this emotional epidemic is not properly managed, it was six times more predictive of cancer and heart disease than cigarette smoking, high cholesterol levels, and elevated blood pressure. I am referring to an invisible, you can't see it, intangible, you can't touch it, emotional epidemic called stress. Stress is indiscriminate. It does not discriminate. It'll knock on your door if you're old, and it will come in your room if you're young. It will find you if you're rich. It will find you if you're poor. Everyone, no matter what season or state of life they are in, is vulnerable to the reality of stress, and the 1130 is not talking back to me. Somebody say stress. Everyone is vulnerable to stress. The, the student is stressing about taking the test. The teacher is stressing about grading the test. Somebody is stressing because they don't like their job. Somebody is stressing because they can't find one. Somebody is stressing over the wedding. Somebody else is stressing over the divorce. Someone is stressing because they can't find the house they want. Somebody else is stressing because they can't sell the house they have. Somebody's stressing because they can't stop losing weight. Somebody else is stressing because they can't stop gaining it. Somebody's stressing because they want children and can't have them. And somebody's stressing because they don't know if they want the children they have. I'm playing. That's a joke. That's a joke. There are no parents in here that have ever heard a teenager say, I don't like you. You've never heard a teenager say that. And there are no parents in here that have ever said in the secret part of their soul, well, I don't really like you that much either. That's, I'm just not here, not in this church. It's not in this church. Somebody say stress. stress. However, I've got some good news. I feel this side over here. Okay, I'm, here I come. I hear you. I said, somebody say stress. stress. Yeah, I got some good news. Here's the good news. God wants to arrest your stress. This is the quiet section today. I'm coming to liven you up. I said, God wants to arrest your stress. He does. Here it is. Here it is. Someone may say, well, Pastor Darius, how can you say that? I've studied scripture. I don't need to see the word stress 
in Scripture. So how does my spirituality relate to my stress if the word stress is not in Scripture? And you're right. The word itself, stress, is not in Scripture. But there are words used in Scripture that describe a stressful state. One of them is found in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, where the writer says, do not be anxious about anything. Anxious, overwhelmed, tense, stress. He says about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, I love this, with thanksgiving. That's where it didn't say respond with thanksgiving after the prayer, but it says offer thanksgiving with the prayer. That when you send up a prayer for him to do it, Send up a praise because he's already done it. Did you hear me? That praise becomes the articulation of your expectation that while you are talking to God about the problem, he's already working on the answer. I want to see who grew up in old school church here. While you are trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. And I'm not going to wait until the battle is over. I'm going to shout right now. In every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. And the peace of God. It did not say, and peace. But he says, and the peace of God distinguishing or communicating that there is distinction between peace. All peace isn't the same. Jesus even said this when he said, my peace I leave with you, not peace that the world gives. He says there is a type of peace that people of people who are not people of faith have. He says, but that kind of peace is inferior peace because it's temporary peace. It's a peace that doesn't have any weight on it. It's a peace that's fragile. If you bump into it, it falls apart. If the wind blows, it blows out of your life. But Jesus says, I want to give you a different kind of peace. I'm going to give you some peace that's got some weight on it. I'm going to give you some peace that's got some roots. So that when the winds blow, you'll be like a tree. Your peace will bend, but it won't break. Good God Almighty. This peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. This piece, he says, transcends your understanding. It's illogical. It don't even make sense. When people ask you why you so calm, you don't even have an answer because it surpasses your understanding. You just know somehow, some way, beyond the realm of the five senses, you got a sixth sense that's telling you everything is going to be all right. I don't know how, but he's working it out. I don't know when, but he's working it out. I don't know where, but he's working it out. I got something on the inside, my sixth sense that's telling me. Be anxious for nothing. Why, Pastor Darius? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, be anxious for nothing because your Savior has sympathy. What, what does that mean? That's cute. You rhyming, Pastor. I told you I should have been a rapper, but here it is. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? It means that God is not some eternal, unengaged, emotionless being. He feels. He has sympathy. His heart breaks when our heart breaks. And his sympathy and his empathy produces intervention. You can only see your child cry so long. The Bible says of Jesus, we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. When you stress, he feels it. And and, and I'm reminded of a story in the book of Acts chapter 7 where this man named Stephen was being unjustly stoned. And the Bible says as he's being stoned, he has this vision of Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Now that standing is significant because every other reference about Jesus next to the Father has Jesus seated. 
But the Bible says when Stephen gets stoned, Jesus goes from sitting to standing. In other words, don't you make me come down there. And when stones start coming at you and me in life, Jesus stands up off the throne. And the Father's got to hold him back because he's getting ready to come and jump in the fiery furnace like he did with the Hebrew boys and get in the lion's den like he did with Daniel because your Savior has sympathy. He's only going to allow me to suffer for so long. So be anxious for nothing because my Savior has sympathy. Number two, be anxious for nothing because my Savior is sovereign. Pastor, that's cute too. I don't know what none of that means. What does that mean? Sovereign. Sovereign means ultimate power. Supreme power. It means that all others who have power have power on loan. They have a say, but he's got the final say. They have a word, but he's got the last word. They can make a decision. He can overrule and override it. I don't know who this is for that's listening to me, but the answer is not no until God said no. I don't care who else said no. The answer is not no until God says no. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he can turn it whatsoever way he chooses. He's sovereign. An example of his sovereignty is, is seen in the book of Jonah, where this gentleman named Jonah is swallowed up by a whale, and he's sitting in the belly of the whale, and while he's in the whale, Jonah begins to talk to God. The Bible says when Jonah talks to God, God talks to the whale. Jonah talked to God. God talked to the whale. The whale spit Jonah out. Jonah talked to God. God talked to the whale, and the whale spit Jonah out. It didn't say Jonah talked to God, and then God talked to Jonah. Jonah talked to God, then God talked to the whale. Because just because God not talking to you about the problem doesn't mean he's not working on the answer. Sometimes he's not talking to you because he's talking to the whale. Because God speaks well. He speaks the language of whatever's holding you hostage. Everything he created has ears and he knows how to get through to it. Water has ears and when God speak to it, the Red Sea's got to part. Jericho walls have ears and when God speaks to it, the walls have to fall. Whatever has you has ears and God will speak to it and it's got to spit you out. I'm getting ready to prophesy to somebody in here today. It's getting ready to spit you out. You've been, y'all didn't receive it. You've been sitting in the well long enough. It's time for God to spit you out. Okay. And number three, number three, your Savior has sympathy. Your Savior is sovereign. Number three, your Savior is a strategist. God doesn't just make good promises, he makes good on his promises. He's a God of ingenuity. He'll, he'll find a way. Y'all better come get me today. I promise you when he want to get you in a room, he'll find a way. They'll close every door. He'll put a hole in the roof and slide you down through the roof. You'll end up in rooms and people will ask how you got in there and you'll be wondering, I don't know how I got in here either. But I know God is a strategist. And there is an incredible example of God being a strategist in our foundational text in 2 Kings chapter 4. You want to talk about a case study on stress? 2 Kings chapter 4 is a powerful picture of what I'm attempting to proclaim. I mean, this woman is dealing with compound stress. Listen to this. First of all, number one, her husband dies. So she's grieving the loss of her husband. Number two, her husband was the breadwinner. So now she has to figure out how she's going to care for herself and her two children in a cultural context that did not let women work. 
Number three, they had some financial debt. So creditors in those days were coming to take her two sons and pull them into indentured servitude where they would have to work a certain number of years for free to work the debt off. All of this is happening at the same time. She is dealing with what I call a domino dilemma. You ever had one of those? Well, one thing happened, and that one thing messed up a whole lot of other things. So she's trying to grieve the loss of her husband, figure out how she's going to feed her family and protect her children at the same time. Don't just read the story. I want you to enter her stress. I want you to put yourself in her shoes. You just buried your spouse. You have no way of providing for your children. And now someone is coming that's threatening to take your children away from you. All at the same time. She's dealing with some stress. Are you hearing me? So the Bible says, I love what she does. She doesn't allow her position to cause her to ignore her condition because her husband was a part of this group called the school of the prophets and so he was being mentored by this prophet named Elijah so her husband would be the equivalent of a preacher so she didn't allow her position to cause her to get confused about her condition because she could have said, well, you know, I'm, I'm the preacher's wife, so I've got to have all my stuff together, and I've got to act like everything is okay with me when it actually isn't. She, she made a decision that she would be honest about her condition regardless of her position. And when she went to Elijah and said, listen, man, I need some help. I know I'm saved, but I'm stressed. I'm trying to find a real section in here because it is possible to be saved, love Jesus, know scripture, pray, have a devotional life, and something hits your life that stress you out. And I wish Christians would stop fronting about not having an issue and be honest so that God will deal with the issue. Sometimes we stress. I know I have a position, but this is my condition. I'm stressed. She goes to Elisha. She tells Elisha what's going on, and he asks her a question. Woo, it's a profound question. It's a, it's a powerful question. It's a transformative question. What's the question, Pastor Darius? He asked her, what do you have in your house? She probably like, listen, man. I told you the creditors are coming to take my child. I'm coming to you because I need some money. You talking about what's in my house. Woo, what a powerful statement. In other words, it's, it is as if Elijah is saying, could you be overlooking something that's an asset? Y'all missed it. He said, could it be you in your house every day walking past something and you don't even know what you got? <laughs> could it be that her house literally can be a metaphor for our house? So what was in her house for her is a metaphor for what's in us. Could it be you don't even know what's in you? Could it be God's about to show you how to use something that's been present all alone it's been overlooked and it's been underused because God does not have to give you something new to do something different 
that did you hear what I just said that that you don't have to have a different partner to have a new marriage that you don't have to have a different mind to have a new mind come on somebody that 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 you don't have to have you don't have to have something new in order for God to do something different oh if I had time I'd take you to Moses and I would show you when Moses got in dilemmas he asked God what should he do and God would ask him what's in your hand I'm gonna show you that little rock that little that little rod that little stick that you think can only prop you up if you use that stick right it'll part red seas that that little stick you only using to walk with is a stick that if you throw it down right it'll turn into a snake and swallow up pharaoh's stake i'm gonna show you how to use what y'all what, what's in your house listen to what she said she said i don't have anything listen to this i have nothing there at all except a small jar of olive oil now, I know I got at least three Pentecostals in this service. And when I said that, you should have quickened a something right there. Because if anybody knows the power of the oil, you know the power of the oil. Elijah's like, what you mean all you have is a little oil? What you mean that's all you got? If you got oil, that's all you need. He says, I'm going to show you how to work your oil. And when you work your oil, your oil is going to be the answer to your issue. The oil, for those of us who, who may be trying to catch the metaphor, is a metaphor for the anointing. What is that? That is the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. That is when God puts his super on your natural. It is when God accentuates your ability. It is when God empowers you to do things that are beyond your learning, your training, and your exposure. It, it is when God gives you an anointed intuition that you can't teach or explain it's just when you get in your oil you just know how to do it did you hear what i just said hallelujah and if you can find your oil nobody can beat you when you in your oil no no don't don't pursue her oil don't pursue his oil you pursue your oil because when you get oily the devil can't get a grip on you you slip out of his grip somebody better come get me some people are wondering how you survive some of the things you survive. They don't know that when the devil put his hand on you, he could not hold you because the oil was on your life and you slipped out of his grip. How did you get out? I slipped out. I slipped out because I'm all in. Look at somebody and say, you shining. Now, I want you to say this, not arrogantly, but confidently. Say, I know. I know. I don't deserve it, but it's on me. I don't know why he gave it to me, but he did. He should have took it away, but he didn't. And if it's on me, I'm going to use it. If it's on me, I'm going to walk in it. So I just got a little oil. I just got a little oil. Y'all sit down here. So he says, all right. He says, the way I'm going to deal with your stress is I'm going to teach you how to strategically use your oil. Because it's possible, come here, charismatics, it's possible to be oily and not strategic. <laughs> it's okay, you got oil, but in this season, you need strategy. You are oily, but you have to become strategic because there is no anointing for discipline. There is no discipline prayer. Discipline is a decision. At some point, you got to get tired of letting your oil spoil. You say, I'm too anointed to be in this situation. I got too much in me, too much experience, too many gifts. Too many talents for me to just be here. God wants to add strategy 
to my oil so that I can deliver my oil effectively in a way that it helps others and benefits me. He says, he says I know you're oily, but if I'm going to use you, you got to be oily and reliable. He, he said, you got oil, but you don't meet deadlines. Ooh, the air just swoop. Let me, I'm going to say it again. You got oil. You said, ooh, I can bake a cake. Yeah, but the party is Saturday at 3, so I need it by Saturday at 3. You got the oil, but you got to deliver it strategically. See, I lost all the amens right there because it's like we just want God just because I'm oily just to put me in rooms. But I need to be trustworthy enough to deliver the oil strategically. Let me wrap this up because... Lederick, it was going good till right there. I just, we just need to get ready for fire night. It's just going good till right there. Let me preach to somebody on, online. If you're online, I just want you to type you preaching because they're not helping me preaching here. Just type you preaching. Am I telling the truth? You're like, oh my gosh, she can do some hair, but I can't stay there all day. Oh my God, he can cut hair, but man, he cut, he cut one part, then he talked for five minutes. <laughs> oh Lord, they're about to be going off on me. I ain't scared of y'all, I'm telling the truth. There needs to be structure and strategy. But my oil. Let's wrap up here, because I, I want you to see something. I think this text is tailored to teach us not all stress, but some stress has to be addressed through stewardship. The, this, this, this is a stewardship series, stewarding time, talent, and treasure, because how I manage those three areas can help reduce some stress in my life. Let me, let me give you three strategies I see in the text, and we'll go home. Number one, I see this. I see she submitted, uh, excuse me, she sought the Savior for sanity. That, that's number one. Seek the Savior for sanity. Here it is. Before God can fix it, I need God to settle me. Because stress is an intoxicating emotion, isn't it? Stress is stress, it's, it's intoxicating. Stress is truth juice. Stress will make you say things that you wouldn't say when you're not stressed, right? And, and when we're stressed, many of us are so action-oriented. It's like, I got to fix this. Come on, Jesus, let me get through this. Let's figure this out. And we can begin to act impulsively like Abraham. And we don't wait on God to give us a strategy when we're sober. So we're emotional. And it's like, let me fix this here. Let me fix this now. And when I move impulsively like Abraham, I meet Hagar's and create Ishmael's. God's like, you trying to fix the problem the wrong way, but because you're trying to fix it the wrong way, you created a problem trying to fix one. So now you got to deal with two problems because you weren't honest enough to say, you know what? I'm not in a place right now to make a decision. Jesus, bring me down because I'm on 10 right now. I wish I had an honest church. Lord, I'm, a, I'm on 10 right now. Bring me down, please. Okay, number two. Number two, submit to the sayings of Scripture. He was an Old Testament prophet. He was a mediator. It's the equivalent of us going to Jesus. Uh, this woman obeying what he said is the equivalent of us obeying what Jesus said. And it means we got to submit to the sayings of Scripture with our time, talent, and treasure. Here it is. I'm about to say something. Now, I asked the 9 o'clock, was they ready? And they was like, yes. And then I said it, and they weren't ready. Then I just asked the 10, 15. I was like, y'all sure y'all ready? Because the 9 weren't ready. They're like, yes, we ready, Pastor. And then they weren't ready either. So here it is, 1130. Are you ready? Okay. Here it is. Here it is. This is what the Bible says in the book of Galatians. I'm going to give you an example. It says, Bear one another's burdens, comma, but let each one bear his own load. Now, most people hear that, but they don't submit to it. 
And when you don't submit to that, you create unnecessary stress. So here it is. When it says bear one another's burdens, that word burdens means like boulder or a big rock. Something that people can't move on their own. But, but when it says, uh, but let each one carry his own load, that word load means backpack. So a boulder, a big rock, is something they can't move by themselves. They can't carry. A, nap pack, a knapsack or a backpack is something they can carry, but they won't. It's the equivalent of saying this. God calls me to help you with what you cannot do. He does not call me to be responsible for what you will not do. You treating a backpack like a boulder. And here many of us are, we are stressed out because you're trying to carry your rocks and carry somebody else's backpack. And here you are, you responsible and you miserable. They irresponsible, they chill, they're like, oh, I'm lit. Oh, look at this. Y'all aren't talking to me. You looking at them on Snapchat, they happy. You stress. Because we're being responsible for somebody else's irresponsibility. My gosh, are you hearing me? We got to submit to the saying of scripture. With our time, with our talent, with our treasure. What does the scripture say about my treasure? How can I, met all, everything God says is going to help reduce the stress in my life. So it may feel stressful on the front end, but that stress on the front end creates less stress on the back end. So what does he say? What does he say when he talks about putting him first? Through the tithe. Okay, all right. It's, it's, it may feel stressful on the front end, but it's a blessing on the back end. We don't do that to avoid a curse. Like, we don't, we don't do, uh, that's, that's acting out of fear, not out of faith. We don't do it to avoid a curse. We do it to receive the benefits. We do it because God didn't even say he would curse us if we did. He said, you are. Which means that it means that that area of your life, since you have chosen to keep me uninvolved, is subject to the vicissitudes of the economy you're a part of. So as long as everything is cool, calm, and copacetic, you're going to be straight. He says, but if there's ever a time where you need my intervention because you decided that's an area you don't want me involved in, I'm going to give you what you want and not be involved because he does not force his way into any area we don't invite him into he's saying I'm trying to just open the windows of heaven over you which means I want to make sure you have access to every God ordained opportunity so that if it does not happen you know it's not me why? Because heaven is open for me. And when heaven is open for me, what's mine will be mine. I got to submit to the sayings of the scripture. And I'm done. Here's the last one right here. I've got to seize and strategically spread the oil. Somebody say seize it. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. Are y'all ready for this? People will take your time if you let them. Right? And we'll be upset when you don't spend it the way they think you ought to spend it. I mean, what was you doing? You couldn't call me back. Somebody say strategically. Spread it. You know, m many of us are stressed because we spread too thin. Here's my question for those of you that are like me, action-oriented. You got to know yourself. And I know I can, be a, I can be an animal. I should be tired of school. There's two more degrees I want. Hmm. Uh, so here it is. This is my point. At some point, though, you got to ask yourself, how much is enough? 
not be complacent, but this is what I mean. What am I not willing to violate to advance? Does that make sense? And I'm at a season in my life, I'm not willing to violate this. Like my local churches. Because the local church still, see, this is, this is what I know. I know the reason people know me outside of change church is because of change church. I know there are people sitting in this room right now who were sitting with me in a, in a building that didn't have an air conditioner on Pennington Avenue. So I'm not, am I, am, I, am I making sense? It's like, okay, I will go as far as I can go without jeopardizing and neglecting this. Here it is. I, I'm not willing to neglect my, my marriage and my family. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, man, if you would do this, you could be this. But... But no, I'm, I'm, I'm a young man. I need me and Lady D to be right. See, y'all, this service, can y'all handle that? No, I'm young. We need to be right. I need her to wake up in the morning and look at me and say, this is my boyfriend. I'm like, yes, I'm your boyfriend. I want you to want me, want me. She texts me today talking about, I miss you. I'm like, keep on. <laughs> Let me go to this. That side, I lost that whole side of the church right here. This the real section right here. Okay. But keep on. This is what I know. I know, I know Shamika Daniels and Seth and Gabriel will want me when I'm 60. I know Change Church will want me when I'm 60. Everybody else only wants you while you hot. When's enough enough? So I'm going to go as far as I can go without losing my mind. I'm going to go as far as I can go without compromising my values. Well, you got to do this to get in the industry. God's going to get me in another way. I just prophesied to somebody right there. God is going to get you in through the back door. There's another entrance. There's another way. You don't have to sell out. Can't do it. It's gonna spread me through too thin. Spilling oil. Some of us, even as parents, man, these kids will spread you thin. Me and my wife, we had we had to have a talk early on. I had to, I had to pull up to the side and say, baby, listen, he can't he can't play baseball. He can't, baby, it's on a tee. He missing it. It's on a tee. See, we honest in our house. I'm not telling you how to run yours. I'm talking about my this baby. It's, it's T-ball. He strike it out. This, God ain't call him to this. This three practices a week, we sit in these games. It's hot. I'm thirsty. I'm coming out here. I'm watching him strike out. It's like, no, man, we're going to do two or three things. Let's pick. Somebody pray for me right now in tongues right now. Pray for me. So I'm not telling you not to put your kids in sports. That's not my job to tell you what you're doing in the house, in your house. That's my job as a pastor. My job is just to provoke you to think about what could be some areas where you are spread really thin. And for some of you, it's time to rein it in, bring it in. Because you've been stressed long enough. And we need to stop acting like we can't be saved and stressed. But God wants to arrest that stress. Amen? So our time is up. I think we've already received the offering for today. Some of you, if you haven't had a chance to give, we want you to give. You can give online. we got giving boxes. You can give there. Uh, online family, you can give online. Some of you gave, but you didn't obey. And uh, you, you want to submit to the saying of Scripture. You gave something, but you didn't obey God. You didn't give the tithe. And 
You can have an opportunity to do that. I'm going to dismiss you this way today, though. We're going old school. I never want to embarrass you. Some things I do, I, I never want to embarrass you. So if I ever ask you to do something, it's because I at least feel prompted and stirred that it's going to serve you in some way. So I'm going to pray the benediction, but I'm going to do that while praying for people who say, Pastor Darius, God spoke to me today because I'm saved and I trust God. But I'm like the, the father Jesus dealt with when he said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because I got faith and a little bit of stress at the same time. And it's so heavy. And this is what I want to pray for. Everybody's dealing with some stress. I want to pray specifically for those of you who are dealing with extreme stress. Meaning there are symptoms manifesting in your body. Chest is tight. Heart palpitations. I'm, 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 I'm praying God is going to touch people right now whose stress has affected your ability to have a full night's sleep. God don't want us to live that way. And today, there's help in Zion. So we're going to pray the benediction, but would you let pastor pray for you? I'm not going to lay hands on you. That's for fire night. But I, I feel somebody needs God to help them with this. Because it's time for some peace. So let's go old school today. If you're here, you say, Pastor Darius, you're talking to me. Real quick, would you, uh, if you feel comfortable, would you get as close to this platform as you can? It represents the altar of God. And I believe as you come close to the platform, it's a metaphor for you coming close to God. I'm, I'm so stressed, Pastor. I got symptoms in my body. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I got symptoms in my body and the devil's now playing with my mind. He's telling me stuff is wrong with me physically and I know nothing's wrong. I'm just, it's just too much. It's too much for me, Pastor. And I trust God, but I've been carrying this too long. And I need him to help me. So I'm going to pray this prayer, and it's going to be the benediction at the same time. I'm going to pray this prayer. It's going to be the benediction at the same time. <clears throat> Some of you may be at this altar, and you may say, Pastor, I want God to help me with this stress, but I don't, I don't know if he will because... I'm stressed about stuff I got myself into. I want you to know that the story of the gospel is the story of a God getting humanity out of a mess they got themselves into. It's called grace and mercy. It's God saying, you got in it, but I'm going to get you out. So, Father, right now, I pray over every person at this altar, every person that had the faith to come, may their coming be seen as their faith. And I pray for those having symptoms in their body that are expressions of stress, may you cause these symptoms to cease and give us a peace that passes all understanding. May the power of God touch our minds. For you did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound, I pray for a sound mind. In the name of Jesus, lift the burden, destroy the yoke, give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. May those who have sown in tears reap in joy. For you said a weeping only endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We declare it's morning time. It's time for joy time for sleep I pray for people who just feel like it's too much I can't take anymore broaden their shoulders give them strength to carry but they could not carry on their own as we cast our cares on you you care for us our burden bearer our heavy load sharer 
Now may your grace and the sweet communion of your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide hence now and forevermore. May you bless us, keep us, cause your face of favor to shine upon us. Be gracious to us, protect us, provide for us, and above all else, grant us peace. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Give your God praise as you go, family. Well, listen, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that message. Hold on one second before you click me off here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for finding this YouTube channel as a trusted source of spiritual nourishment for you, whether it's your first time or whether you're a consistent, faithful follower of this channel. I just want to say thank you. And secondly, I want to ask you to help me. I want to reach as many people as possible with this life-changing message. And one of the ways you can help me do that is if this message blesses you, would you just share it with someone else? That's it. Uh, I'm asking you to share because I believe we're blessed to be a blessing. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for allowing us to add value to your life. If you are ever in the New Jersey Philadelphia, New York area. We got campuses in New Jersey. I'm live there on Sunday mornings for services. And if you are in or know someone in the Orlando, Florida area, we've got a church in Orlando. It meets on Saturday evenings at 530 and I speak there live. No video. I'm in Florida on Saturday nights and I'm in New Jersey on Sunday mornings. And I love to meet you, greet you and to say what's up to you. Thank you so much. God bless. Take care.